The FAA, as pilots, is it an organization to be feared? Or is it an entity out there to help us? We're going to find out in the hangar. Hello and welcome to In the Hangar. I'm Dan Milliken. And I'm Christy Wong. Today's episode is brought to you by Wingfield Aviation. Okay, the FAA, we've got with us here, he, he, he came to our set, a representative from the FAA. He did. Awesome. Rob Lowe, thank you so much for coming. Hi Dan, good morning. Nice to meet you. Okay, nice Rob, you. first of all, introduce yourself and uh, your title, what you do for the FAA, and a little bit of background. Okay, well, I am currently the regional administrator uh, for the southwest portion of the U.S. That's a five-state area, Arkansas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, Texas, and New Mexico. Uh, my current position, I'm the FAA administrator's senior FAA executive in that area, representing the FAA uh, to external entities and also internal. I uh, have over 35 years with the agency, uh, all but about two years of that is air traffic control uh, in various levels of that. In, um, started out as an en route controller at Albuquerque Center many, many years ago and worked in a bunch of different facilities, worked in our national headquarters, our command center in D.C., uh, have led terminal uh, and en route facilities and even been the director of the center third of the United States for air traffic. Wow. wow. Well, you throw out words like executive and administrator. Is that basically mean like, uh, are you the big boss for this four or five state area? So in in our organization, all the sub portions of our massive agency are all organized differently, which is probably to no surprise to anyone, right? <laughs> and and back way back in the day, yes, the regional administrator had line authority and everybody had some direct reporting, and that's not the case anymore. My primary role is really one of horizontal integration. Uh, I represent the agency both externally to congressional entities, local elected officials, airlines, operators. Uh, a lot of times we end up uh, facilitating conversations even just within the agency where various subsections aren't quite working together and we end up being the piece where it rolls up to our level and pulling that together. So let me ask you this, are you a pilot? I am not a manned pilot. I at one point had my license many years ago, um, had kids and money kind of prevented that, but I am an active uh, remote control pilot okay. and drone pilot. Oh, cool. All right. So, um, you know, I've had a little bit of experience with FISDO. We won't go into that. But um, I was scared, shaking in my boots. I had sleepless nights leading up to it. And I went in, and what I experienced surprised me. What I experienced was a kinder, gentler FAA. Is that a real thing? It is, and I'm really glad to hear that you had that experience, Dan, to be honest with you. Uh, we are on a pathway to move towards even more of that, and it really is all about safety. If you think about what the FAA exists to do, we are there um, to regulate an industry. Uh, so that comes to things like aircraft certification, right? The pilot check ride you're used to. Um, com actually, compliance with the regulation or the law, right? Um, and in our history, our practice of that is we always looked at events and incidents kind of from a backward looking back standpoint, right? We would look back, try to figure out what happened and see if we could make that better in the future. Well, that created an enforcement culture for us. And, and that is kind of the police kind of outlook that maybe some people have in their mind that that's what the FAA does. Um, but primarily, I guess in the 80s into the 90s, um, things began to change in the aviation industry as they did in a lot of places with safety reporting systems, things like the NASA reporting system and mm, you right. know, ASAP for airline pilots, and we have reporting systems like that for our controllers and technicians within the agency. Mm. Uh, that, real real quick, for, for our pilots and student pilots that are new, what are you talking about the NASA reporting? So the NASA safety reporting system is a system that now you can access it online. Um, and anytime you observe anything that looks to be a safety risk or you're involved in anything that you think um, could have been done better, or even so if that's for yourself in the cockpit where you're flying, it's something you observed while you were operating in the system or you observed it as maybe an air traffic uh, it, issue or procedure. The NASA safety reporting system is a place where you can go and report everything about that anonymously if you choose to. It certainly has no retribution, no, no fallback, there's no penalty for doing that. Uh, and what that does is create a database that then can be mined for trends and, and risk. And, and we've, over the years, uh, in partnership with the NTSB, have found lots and lots of things within the system that have changed, frankly, the way that the system operates, from the way we certify aircraft 
aircraft to the way we do air traffic control procedures. So I've heard people say that the NASA report is a get out of jail free card. Mm -hmm. Is that essentially what it is? So there really isn't a connection to the two. Okay. Um, so the NASA safety reporting system, in addition to all the other ones that are out there, are really there to gather safety information. There's not a direct connection between that report uh, and the part that the FAA Flight Standards Organization plays in terms of enforcement or compliance with our regulations. So we've moved from the enforcement philosophy where Dan had a fear when he went in that they would chop an arm off or whatever, right? We've moved from that and, and that really is, is the next step that came after the safety reporting systems that were, that were larger across the entire industry. We've moved to what initially we called a compliance philosophy. We now call that our compliance program. Uh, and the compliance program is exactly what you experienced, Dan. It's one of trying to find a way to educate if that's the uh, thing that caused the issue, that caused them to um, become aware of your flight, maybe that you know your, your drone flight that you described. Mm -hmm. um, it's really a free exchange of safety information that we're looking for, and and much like Dan described his his experience with them, they will refer you back to well, here's what the regulation says, mm -hmm. and then how can we um, get you up to speed, and more importantly, how can we learn from your experience and spread that word? So the compliance program really is more about helping to educate and improve, so we don't have a repeat experience, not just with that one pilot or the one entity, but system wide. How do we do that? So it blends and dovetails with the safety reporting systems. Okay. With the FAA being more kinder and gentler now, what are some of the safety concerns that you still have? So I think one of the, the risks that we see um, right now, one of the largest areas of risk is what we call surface safety, uh, operations on the surface of airports. Uh, we see a lot of risk right now um, around that. Some of that is wrong surface uh, operations where an aircraft either lands or departs on a place that was unintended. Sometimes that's landing on a taxiway, departing the wrong runway, uh, those kind of things. Um, there's a lot of uh, operations around that where we have what we call runway incursions, mm -hmm. uh, when a pilot is you know, instructed to hold short of a runway, for example, and they go ahead and cross it, or maybe they just put the nose across the end of the hold short line and we have someone on final. So safety on the surface uh, is really probably our largest risk right now. And, and mm -hmm. where it really plays to your audience, uh, general aviation, unfortunately, is the highest uh, rate of incident that we see for surface, so, safety. for surface safety. So just talk about wrong surface operations for just a minute that I mentioned a minute ago. Mm -hmm. When you look at uh, what our current data shows us through 2018, wrong surface arrivals, landings on the wrong surface, uh, over 80%, I think it's 86% of those happen with general aviation aircraft. Over 90% of those happen in daytime, uh, and about 88% of it happens in VFR weather. So it's kind of counterintuitive. You would think the problem would be at night, and I couldn't tell which was the runway, and I right. landed in the wrong place. That absolutely not borne out by the data. It's VFR, daytime, and general aviation at smaller airports. Uh, well, primarily. there was a high-profile case, you know, with a particular celebrity utilizing <laughs> his GA aircraft, and right. you know, of course, the question I think that comes to mind is, how could this happen? Well, so a, a lot of it is, um, well, it really has multiple facets to it, right? So some of it is training, recognition. Some of it is task overload um, in, the, in the cockpit or maybe even in the, in the case of the air traffic control tower. Um, the operation uh, for departures is very similar to arrivals. So I talked about wrong surface arrivals. Surprisingly, we have almost an equal 50-50 break oh, right. in wrong surface departures. Uh, and you would be really surprised that sometimes at an intersection takeoff, um, an aircraft will be instructed to depart on a runway that the only, they're down near the end. The only way they can really get onto that runway is a right turn, and they'll turn left and depart with a thousand feet of runway and oh barely make. A, I mean, it, it sounds incredible, that, but it does happen. Wow. Um, we have yeah. we have people turn on um, taxiways and depart on those, thinking it's the runway, just being unfamiliar. So so we have a lot of. Um, strategies that we're trying to partner with the industry to okay. improve that, right? So we have a, um, I'm part of our uh, National Runway Safety Council, which is a, a collaborative industry group that not only has representation from the FAA, but we have uh, industry representatives. Uh, and our goal there is really to find uh, ways to mitigate 
some of the risk that we see. And one of the strategies we have uh, is a great new video series that we've come out with this last year, and it's called From the Flight Deck. And the From the Flight Deck video series uh, currently is out at about 10 airports. We're going to do about 20 a year until we hit what we think we're going to be somewhere around 300 airports across the country eventually. We'll have that. And the advantage of that video series is it's filmed from a pilot's perspective at an airport that has problems or has a number of issues. So you, you'll see on your on your charts a lot of times a hot spot right. at an airport. That's an area that gets identified that we have um, repeated events where there's some confusing signage or the geometry is kind of confusing, causing you to do what I described, you know, pull onto the taxiway or whatever. The From the Flight Deck video series is designed to show you from a pilot's perspective, from the cockpit, what do those areas look like out the window? How do you see it on the chart? How do those correlate? And they're filmed with local operators at each one of those airports. Um, they're not terribly long once we get them done. They're several minutes long. But the idea being, if you're going to that airport, we want this to be a resource that, hey, I'm headed to Lincoln, Nebraska. That's one of the first ones we did. Uh, pull that up, take a look at it before you get there. It's also a great resource for flight instructors, uh, as they're even if they don't fly at that particular airport. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, examples out there and we're continuing to grow that and I think that is uh, going to be a great resource it's gotten a lot of very positive feedback so far are those are those videos available on YouTube they are the FA has a YouTube channel you can right. also access it through our FA website and I think we have a sample okay let's have a sample let's uh let's watch it real quick here All right, wow, that's that's great. I actually went on and watched the one for um, uh, Kansas City. Okay. So uh, that one was there because I've flown into Kansas City before, and I was like, oh, wow, cool. And it was um, very informative. Good, good. Yeah, so Kansas City downtown, uh, mm -hmm. MCI is, is one, right next to Lincoln was one of the other, uh, the first two we did. I think I did MKC. MKC, okay, yeah, yeah. so those so those are both uh, right there, so. So do you see with um, these runway incursions or these wrong surface, um, you know, incidents, do they typically happen where the pilot was at an unfamiliar airport or was it like at their home airport? What do you see, is there an off balance or is it just a mix of both? So, so we don't have a lot of really in-depth data on that. That. And that's one of the places we're working uh, to try and get better data on. Okay. Um, I think we have some gut feeling as to what we think some of that is, but like most things, it's we want to get to a database decision down the road, kind of like we did with the wrong surface uh, operation piece. We see both, to be honest with you. Um, there was an event uh, at an airport in North Texas just a couple years ago where a gentleman landed on a parallel taxiway um, that has been a problem for us for many years and we've got a lot of mitigations and non-standard painting all kinds of crazy flashing lights things to alert to it and come to find out this guy's had his bonanza based at that airport for 20 years oh, oh, first wow. time he oh, ever my. landed on the parallel taxiway oh, wow. so oh, it, oh. It, it's not always the transient but we do see a lot of transient you know you're not unfamiliar never been there before kind of thing so it's really a mix but like I said I don't know that we have quantifiable data at this point to say the trend is one or the other Okay, so that's surface safety. What else um, are you guys at the FAA, you know, focused on and concerned about? Well, I think there's a lot of things in the system um, that, that we're worried about, uh, you know, at this point. Not necessarily worried, but that we always want to improve. Safety is our prime mission, right? Safety is number one. Uh, we're blessed in the United States that we have the safest, most efficient airspace system in the world. We really are the model the rest of the world uh, follows, but there's always room for improvement, right? So we have... Uh, a, a very rapidly growing uh, industry. We have a lot of um, 
growth in the traditional uh, general aviation uh, airlines are growing while the numbers of individual airlines keep merging and the numbers are getting smaller the number of operations is increasing so we're stressing our capacity on on the airspace on, on the airspace as well as on the ground right um, it, but it's not just the traditional manned aircraft that are that are causing some of that capacity strain, yeah, unmanned. Right? yeah let's talk about that yeah so so <laughs> unmanned is one of them unmanned aircraft system we call it UAS right but that uh, a lot of times you buzzword people use drugs own uh, with that, but it really does encompass anything that is not piloted. It could be anything from the traditional uh, remote control airplane to the drone that you're, you're used to seeing, the quadcopter, to um, all the way up to primarily military, large, as big as an airliner, unmanned systems that are employed through the military. Those are all operating domestically in our national airspace system today. So we have that. Um, how do we integrate that into our system, right? The base level, when you look at the way our national airspace system is built, the very base level that the layers of safety fall back on, the final level is the human that sits in the cockpit and looks out the window and provides that separation, I'm not gonna run into something or someone else, right? So now we have entrants that don't have that. How do we replicate that? How do we put those in there? Um, how do they mix with you and your manned airplane? How do we separate those? So we're working on that actively with unmanned systems right now. I mean, would you think there'll be some something similar to ADS-B put on uh, all drones or anything like that? Well, I think there's, uh, there's a future for something very similar. Uh, the agency has a notice of proposed rulemaking, which is one of those governmental uh, requirements for when we want to change requirements requirements and regulations, how we notify the public. There is a, a notice out right now for remote ID, uh, and that will drastically change the way that unmanned systems operate within the national airspace system. Um, the rule is still out for comment at this point, um, so we are looking for active comment back from uh, the operators, but and we'll adjust it as needed based on those comments. But eventually what that's looking for is the unmanned vehicle itself to transmit uh, its location, its operation. So much like uh, ADSB, but it, those vehicles are very small and they can't right, handle, can handle that, that equipment. Yeah, exactly. So a lot of the, the current drones uh, that are made by companies like DJI out of China, they already mm -hmm. do that. Um, hmm. The other connectivity piece in the NOTAM is we're looking for the operator to have a connection uh, to the internet, primarily like through a cell phone or an iPad. Then that way that information gets uploaded so everyone can see it. Um, and so we're talking primarily below 400 feet, but we want to be able to identify. So if you think about your license plate on your car, the remote ID theory is you will be transmitting an identification number that is much like the license plate on your car. It's not going to show uh, your name, your home address, your phone number. Nobody can access that from, from the public, but they can see the license plate number uh, and turn that in just like a car that's speeding and, you know, wrecked and need to report to the police, that sort of thing. Is, is there pushback on that because of the over overreach of Big Brother kind of yeah there's so there's a lot of conversation going on right now right and so while the um, notice is out for comment the agency can only talk about what is in the in the in the right. proposal itself so we can't really advocate yay or nay on that but there is a lot of varying opinions uh, <laughs> yeah. on that but it Imagine is in that varying opinions it in is the pilot community it is the foundational the piece <laughs> to know what's out there and for the man uh, pilots that you know much of your audience Dan uh, are how do they transition through that area where, where that will be? And you've seen pieces on the news where there's companies out there that want to deliver your prescriptions to your house with right. a drone. They want to bring you food. They Amazon, want to, you know, of course they want to deliver your whatever it is that you ordered. Is that overnight. for real? There, there's, it, it's, it's out there. It's being tested right now. We have a lot of active test programs that the agency is partnering with NASA and others on where we're proving technology where we can fly beyond visual line of sight of the operator, right. where we can fly uh, in dense environments. We have a test going on in my region in South Texas where uh, we're proving what we call UTM, which is unmanned traffic management. But how do we separate all those things from each other and from the manned aircraft? And um, we've proven it in a recent test in partnership with NASA, upwards of 200 vehicles in the urban environment of downtown Corpus Christi in the tall buildings and flying and separating. And uh, so a lot of that technology is still being proven. We've got a long ways to go, but we're still we're proving that actively on various uh, places around the country. Oh. And in, in going more science fiction, or maybe it's not fiction, I don't know, you, you hear about, you know, uh, of course, Uber's been testing the driverless cars. You've got drones that are getting big enough that people are starting to fly them. You know, um, and we're not quite at the age of the Jetsons yet, but are we going to start seeing, is, that, uh, is it science fiction or is it science that we'll start seeing 
vehicles like flying cars. I think it's I think it's some of both, and I think we're headed that way for sure. I think there are definitely companies out there actively working right. to create a uh, pilotless taxi. Right. Um, they're actively working. Our agency's working with them. Uh, they want to operate in and out of, say, a major airport like a Dallas Fort Worth, and bring you on an unmanned taxi, drop you off at the terminal and then have you board your manned airliner flight for the rest of the way, or just maybe move you around downtown, you know, to go to a restaurant and back. That, That's definitely there. There's uh, a lot of... There's no challenges there with the airspace, is there, there? There is a lot of challenges, and it ranges not just from how do we separate the vehicles from each other. I'll give you a great example. Um, one of the things that, so Dallas-Fort Worth is obviously a very large airport for those of you that have been there. Um, Uber is a company that desires to have Dallas-Fort Worth be one of their prototype places. They fly these taxis. Initially, they will be manned, but eventually unmanned. Hmm. The way they want to get to the terminal is where the cars drive. They want to fly over the, the road down the middle of the terminal, kind of okay. in between the runways. If you remember DFD, Parkway. International Parkway, we yeah. call that Spine mm -hmm. Road. They want to fly up and down that, but they want to do about 100, 150 an hour. Um, of these taxis up and down there. And so we have requirements. You come back off the end of the runway on short final for closely spaced parallels. DFW has lots of parallel runways. Uh, the aircraft are required to respond to a uh, traffic collision and avoids their TCAS system, right? right? The technology and the algorithms that TCAS uses sees those vehicles and it, it would require out. virtually every arrival to go around because oh, of those taxiways. Wow. So it's not just our procedures, it's not just separating those two, it's the algorithms in the TCAS systems we've got to figure out. How do we wow, how do we get all that to work? How does it recognize when that vehicle that's just a taxi bringing you to the airport is not a threat to that aircraft? So there's a lot of work to be done, but we're actively working that as we move forward into the future. Rob, that's amazing with the future. Um, why don't we, if you're willing, open it up to questions from our studio audience? You bet. I'd love to. Okay. So anybody have a question? Okay. So introduce yourself and then say your name. Hi, I'm or, Joe Roscoe. Your and I'm Joe Roscoe. <laughs> yeah. I mean, introduce <laughs> yourself. Yeah. We'll get it all out of the way. Um, I'm a rusty pilot returning after about 40 years of not flying. Uh, and I find out there's things like ADSB out. I'm going, whoa, how very interesting. What kind of pushback was there against ADSB out being such a specific identification of an aircraft in the airspace? Is it a, is it intended to be just separation and identification, or is it also intended to be, now I got you, you SOB? Th Joe, that's a great question, and, we, and we've heard that uh, a number of times. So the reality of what ADSB out is, it complements the ADSB in portion, right? And the idea behind uh, ADSB is really enhancing uh, the surveillance that we have. Our system was traditionally built on land-based or surface-based surveillance. Think of radar. It's mounted to a, a specific place on the Earth. We're migrating to a satellite-based navigation system, which is what ADSB is. Um, part of the in and out portion, to answer your question, really has to do with fully identifying everything about the vehicle, whether it be unmanned or a manned aircraft. Um, so the ADSB out portion tells the rest of the system um, who you are, what your, uh, your flight plan is connected to that, but your climb rate, your turn rate, your speed, your altitude, all of those things are in there. Gets fed into systems like TCAS systems, it gets fed into our um, tra air traffic control systems within the FAA. Um, and that information really gives us a broader picture of truly not only what your intentions are, but what your vehicle or your aircraft is doing uh, right at the moment. So there's not a um, intent with that system to create a, uh, I want to catch you, I want to know, you know, I, I, you know, see what you've done wrong. That really is not the intent of it. It really is about increasing the level of safety from a satellite-based navigation system. In the event of a accident, uh, if you think about, we've had in large aircraft for a long time, we've had black boxes that are painted orange, right? Um, to go back and recreate things in, in a accident. The ADSB out portion, what that really augments now is there is a lot of information that is now stored in the system, in the broader in the cloud, of how that operation happened until you got to that point. So it will help us with that as well, information we've never had on small general aviation aircraft before. All right, who's next? 
Hi, my name is Paul Prideau, and I fly out of Virginia, and I'm happy to be here today. Um, I've been noticing lately in the news there's been talk about uh, more lasers coming from the ground into cockpits, and of course that makes for a very exciting news story, but do you see it as a real issue in terms of affecting safety, or how common is that really? Yeah, Paul, I'm really glad you asked that. I happen to, one of the other hats that I wear is I chair a task force in North Texas that's a laser mitigation task force that goes across multiple government agencies uh, and local operators. And the reason we even have that task force is laser strikes are a very real threat to the pilot community. Um, they happen a lot um, in terms of we probably see um, national statistics, uh, we see tens of thousands a year. We probably see just, wow. I'll give you an example, in North Texas we average about 10 to 15 a month, um, just oh in the gosh. Dallas-Fort Worth area alone. Uh, one of the things that the FBI tells us, who's part of our task force, that there's two typical uh, perpetrators. One is the young um, adult, typically a teenager that's very science curious, and they just want to see, can I do it? And they kind of point um, the, the laser at the aircraft. The more common perpetrator, in their words, that, that we find is uh, a male, and they, they're in their 20s and 30s, sometimes 40s. They often are single, and they sometimes have a criminal history, but there's a bit of a um, technical aptitude there, and for them, it's a, re a response they really can't resist. An, an urge, if you will, uh, and that really makes it nice for us because w how we typically find those is we'll get a report. Pilots are required to report a laser strike to air traffic as you're as you're flying, uh, and when they do, we have partners in law enforcement that often will fly over there with their helicopters. And this urge piece, from what I've learned from the FBI, is they really can't not do it again. So the 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 police helicopter flies by with all the video and everything, and they're standing there in their backyard in their shorts and they shoot the helicopter and then we you know fortunately we have federal statutes now that we can prosecute that was something that congress helped us with uh, about 10 years ago and it really makes it better because it now is a federal offense to interfere with the flight of an aircraft with the laser and, the, and you asked about the threat the threat is very real to to your vision um, there's there's several things that can happen not only can it damage your vision itself you have eye and retina damage um, when the laser hits your cockpit, um, it usually obviously is coming through a window. Um, the window diffracts that light. The laser colors are typically green, red, or blue, blue being the most pervasive or most invasive. Mm. Um, but you get it's much like a lightning strike. The initial impact that you see, especially if you're flying obviously at night, your eyes have adjusted, your night vision's there, you probably have red lighting on in your cockpit, and now there's this flash, and you do get a flash blindness. Laser strikes typically happen at lower altitudes, uh, and you're in probably a critical phase of flight, and now you have a flash blindness and lose the ability to read your instruments. It's not just the threat to your eyes, it is the threat to you operating the aircraft in a critical phase of flight. So it's a very serious thing, and I'm glad you asked about it, but we're actively working to try and catch that. Unfortunately, a lot of times, we can't get law enforcement there fast enough because our response when we call them has to be a surface unit, uh, and then by the time there, the person's gone back in their house. But we do track that and actively across the nation partner with law enforcement to try and mitigate it. Wow. I did not realize it was such a big problem. I mean, I knew it was an issue, but that on that scale, that is bothersome. That's crazy. That is amazing. Okay, back here. Hi, my name's Dave Mueller. I'm just starting to pursue my private, but I had a question. I'm curious, can a controller tell if I've got ADSB? in or out when I'm flying around? So Dave, great question. Uh, and for the most part, the answer is yes. Um, when you have it turned on, so if you don't have it turned on, then no, we can't. But right, if you've got the system on and operating like it's supposed to be, our systems do detect that. Um, our controllers that are working at radar position in an approach control or an in route center, they get that fed through the system and they can see that information. In our air traffic control towers, we have a display that they can look at and see, and they can see that information there as well. But our tower controllers, for the most part, are looking out the window uh, and having that conversation with you on the either on the surface or as you're arriving and departing. But yes, they do have a display where they can see that as well. So you may get, um, especially if you're taxiing out, talking to maybe clearance delivery or ground control, um, if it's not showing up and they think it should be by the way you filed your flight plan indicating you have that equipment, you may get a question to, you know, is it actually on and those sort of things. So they'll be surprised if that kind of question comes, that's where that is. We're just making sure that we're seeing what you say you have on board. But to his question follow-up, if, if I don't have ADSB, 
you can still see me on radar, right? Absolutely. We still have all of our legacy systems. Like I mentioned, the tower is looking out the window. We're doing a lot of visual separation from the controllers and their expertise on, um, you know, timing and all of that. But our radar systems, we still have legacy-based, um, land-based radars that will see you as soon as you depart. Your transponder, we're still using transponders, right? So that is uh, what we call mode two. That's a secondary radar that's interrogating your transponder so I know it's you and not you. Um, and then ADSB is obviously just an enhanced version of, of the identification and all the information we talked about a minute ago that it displays. All right, any other questions? Okay, we've got one more here. Yeah, thanks for coming out, Rob. My name's Jay Yurish. I'm a student pilot flying out of McKinney. Uh, as as a student pilot, what ha what type of incidents and mistakes are you seeing other student pilots make that would come to your attention? That's great, Jay. I appreciate that. I think um, probably one of the the things that we don't get involved with as much. Um, as mistakes that student pilots typically make, the flight instructor community would probably see um, a lot of it happens on that first or second solo flight, maybe your first cross country um, where you're nervous, right? So, so it may not be something that get really rises to the level of the flight standards portion of the FAA, something that, like what Dan mentioned earlier, that they're gonna follow up with you on that. Um, but really, I mean, we've all, we've all been there, right? That initial, that first time you solo and then your first cross country, you know, you're nervous and, and some of that, I think the advice that, that we like to pass back is fly the airplane, you know, try, try to find that calm spot, continue to fly the airplane. When you get nervous, you get worried, don't stop flying the airplane, just keep flying, do what you need to do. And that's, that would be my advice back to you. Things that we do see um, that rise to our level uh, sometimes get to the point where students uh, get lost uh, or they get confused and they're afraid to ask for help. Uh, and then they either taxi or go to the wrong airport or they go to the wrong runway or they fly a place they shouldn't be flying, go in a different direction. I would say that probably the one thing that I would encourage student pilots to do is don't be afraid to ask for help. Early on before you're flying by yourself, work with your instructor, make sure you're comfortable on the radio, make sure they take you to a place where you have a tower or some other air traffic control that you get the experience of interfacing with on the radio. And then when you're by yourself, if you have a question, ask. Our controllers are there to provide a service. We assume you're okay. We don't want to bother you and assume you don't know, but we will absolutely respond quickly if you give us any indication you have a question or need help. Yeah, I've seen that happen at McKinney, some of the students coming in, and you're right, the control tower is there to help you out. You come in, hey, I'm a student, I need, can you give me a hand with this or give me a little extra latitude or a little extra space? They've been <laughs> really eager to help out and uh, get that done. Yeah, absolutely. And even as simple as taxi instructions, uh, a lot of times student pilots go to an airport that they're not used to flying with a tower, uh, and now they get somewhat of a fairly quick taxi instruction down to the runway and they're well I'm not sure I know what all that is don't be afraid to ask for progressive taxi instructions that's what we're there for but we don't want to waste your time if you don't need it so give us a clue reach out and say hey I need some help I'm a student can I have progressive taxi instruction we still ask for progressive yeah it's <laughs> it doesn't matter you don't have to be a student right it's we, we love to help that's what we're there for I recently asked for one yeah so um well that's awesome Rob, thank you so much for, for coming on board and doing thank this, you. and we'll have you again. So uh, for you guys out there, um, so there you have it. The FAA is not really out there to get you no. unless your name is Brian Turner. So <laughs> thanks for watching. I hope that you subscribe, that you like, you share. and We'll see you next time in the hangar.